Some fleets are well advanced on that journey and others are just beginning. But by sharing our knowledge and experience of zero emission fleets, both positive and negative, we have an opportunity to learn, collaborate and adopt best practice. 2021 is the outline date for the proposals. Um, and Greater Manchester is responding to um, the legal challenges that most major cities in the UK uh, have had to have and that's to reach within a legal limit or as close to legal limits as they possibly can uh, by 2024. We're not focusing on the city centre, so it's all 10 districts of Greater Manchester that will be affected by that. So the Wiggins, the Boltons, the Berries, Stockports, everybody will be affected by that clean air zone. So we're trying to lean on other cities and obviously trying to learn from their learnings, Leeds, Birmingham, Nottingham. Oh, so they're all, they're all doing it different ways, but to be honest with you, the size of ours going straight in there is enormous compared to, to them. Even some of the try before you buy schemes that we've been looking to implement um, for taxis, cars, vans, it's whatever other people are trying to do, but replicate it tenfold. Publicly, we have stated that buses, coaches and heavy goods vehicles would be £100 a day. Taxi and private hire vehicles would be £7.50 a day. And LGV vans and minibuses would be £7.50 a day. Uh, and that does still say 2023 from there, but obviously if the government pushed back, that would be 2021. The problem I have is, you know, our directors and senior management for you know, the, the, let's face it, the tax benefits. They were jumped on the plug in high rates. Uh, don't think they were the way to go, but they did. And we had some charging infrastructure in our building. We wanted to get some more of those put in, and you know, some more modern ones, faster charges. But our building was at its electrical capacity. And it's like, well, what do you do with that? So we have already had to upgrade the electrics of the building to accommodate these extra charging units, but we are literally at our max, we can't go any further. It is an increasingly common problem, and the most uh, kind of pop popular first kind of choice of conversation is going to upgrade the amount of power that we've got. But definitely, you wouldn't be looking at upgrading more power uh, unless you had exhausted your potential to balance your load. It may not feel like it for you at the moment, yeah. but there is a natural match between when you're likely to want to charge your electric vehicles and when the rest of your business will need that power. It's not wise to build infrastructure based on usage patterns today, no. and it's not wise to look at what those early adopters look like. Come 2035, come 2050, yeah. if that's not the world that we're going to be living in, it needs, there needs to be solutions for everybody, which I think is going to be a mixture of workplace charging, charging at home, and then this public infrastructure, which will split between on-street destination and transit. But we're moving to high power charging, which a rapid charger is 50 kilowatts, a high power charger can be 125 kilowatts. They will be on your motorway service stops mm. or in specialist EV hubs, which could well be for um, um, commercial vehicles or private hire taxis who only want to be off the road for 10 minutes, as long as it takes to go to the toilet, grab a cup of coffee and then move back out. The commercial side is that the long-term community is this hydrogen fuel cell and battery. So you've got a pure electric vehicle that is hydrogen that it generates its own electricity rather than all the, recharge, the infrastructure recharging points that we need. I mentioned earlier that I, I, I believe pure electric vehicles, plug-in charge vehicles, is part of the solution. However, when we look at what we're trying to achieve, clean air zones in each of the cities, improving air quality, reducing emissions, and I think we need to look at the wider issue. Mm -hmm. The cost of hydrogen, the cost of hydrogen yeah. vehicles alone, the infrastructure of hydrogen. Because um, the investment hasn't been there. The investment for putting in a simple hydrogen station, you're looking at putting in an investment for three, three and a half million. Yeah, at this point in time. At this point, where a different car would use maybe five kilo, kilograms of, of hydrogen. Um, as I said, there, there is no silver bullet, but definitely long term, the way we think it will be, will be certainly, yeah, it'll be more like hydrogen fuel cell for the larger commercial vehicles or buses. That's yeah. the idea. If a bus is on a fixed route, it goes made to be every day of the week, it's fine. You can, you can plan the future. 
but or if you're drunk enough and down the country, you know, you plan that there will be a hydrogen fuel station here, there, and here. But look back how long it's taken for electric charger infrastructure to be put in for, for, for EVs. On smaller vehicles, we you know take eight hours to, to, to fifteen hours before to charge a small electric battery on a car. We're now looking at ramping that up to probably 10, 15 minutes in the next few years. So it's a case of when hydrogen is actually ready for the infrastructure to be here. Um, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? It is, it is chicken and egg. There is no one silver bullet, but electric vehicles, cars like commercials, certainly EV is probably going to be the, the best way forward for that. If the infrastructure is there that you can pull in, get your 150 mile range, pull in for your, for your 15 or 30 minute stop to charge it up. Um, if you look at hydrogen fuel cell, if you go off that beaten track, yeah. you'll have worse range anxiety with hydrogen fuel cell than you will with electric. You know, it's charge anxiety, not not range anxiety. You know, where will you get a hydrogen fuel station? <coughs> well, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I think that's going to be a long, long way away yet mm-hmm. for, for the hydrogen. Fleet. But I think if you look at a fleet across the board, you know, I mean, there's, there's X percentage of your fleet that you can look at, okay, yeah, we can now make this transition to electric on this side of it. It's, it's not that everyone is saying electric is the only way. There is a definite focus on what you can do today is very much around the electrification of your, of your, of your fleet. If you've got larger vehicles, certainly if you've got specialist emergency vehicles, then it, you know that's not necessarily a strong discussion point for today. I mean, let's focus on what you can do. Mm-hmm. Let's not spend yeah. too much time focusing on what we can't do. The time will come. The key to us is, is to identify, first of all, as an electric vehicle suitable for your application and that. And whether it's through a simple just chat regards what you need the vehicle to do from a day to day basis, is it on a fixed route? For the customer to get understand it's more important that, yeah, an EV actually will suit what I need. What I needed to do. Um, whether it's through the telematics that you've already got in your existing fleet to analyse that, we can sit down and analyse your, your existing fleet and we can identify vehicles that will be suitable or not suitable for, 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 for the um, transition to electric. Um, energy saving trust on the other side, then they can come in and they can do a proper detailed cost analysis TCO of moving to electric down to your saving on your carbon, um, etc. So a step two journey, first of all, it's, it's to identify whether an EV is for you or not, um, down to payload, during the use of the vehicle. The second part of the journey then is, is, is the charge infrastructure. You know, we identify whether you need you know, to spend 20 odd grand on the big super duper rapid charger or will a thousand pound charger at seven kilowatts do the same job for what you need to do. And, uh, and then the third part of the journey then is, is the infrastructure, you know, like yourselves, is do you have substation is it you know, capable of giving you the, the power that you require to, to transition over to electric but definitely the data is crucial whether it's energy saving trust or just analyzing your own fleet through your basic telematics or just simply chatting about what you do every day we have done a couple of years ago okay yeah. and is your, what was your experience similar it's very helpful um, it's like a free consultancy basically. Uh, they, come in, they, they took a lot of data off us and came back with some models. Um, it wasn't solely focused on electric, they're looking at um, yeah. LPG as well but for us, which is a little bit of a second step, I think. But, um, so it was, it was very helpful in sort of sentencing. What question charges you? Yeah. What question charges you for the <coughs> application? Right, so we haven't easy. talked about that. Yeah. So the OLEV workplace charger grant is... is... Is an intention. Up to 20 yeah. chargers in place, £500 pound per charger. And it was just an intention. Cars like, are like phones. You know, electric cars are like phones. It's personal choice. It's the colour of the interior. It's this, it's that. <coughs> electric van or commercial vehicle is a square box to do, to do a job. Yes. If it does 100 miles a day, and it does 100 miles in five years' time. And that 100 miles mats or ticks the box for you, it's still the cleanest vehicle. You're not looking at having a Euro 3 vehicle in a Euro 6 environment, it's still the cleanest vehicle in the marketplace. Uh, and you're future proof in your fleet. You can go into the middle of London, like that. Um, and that, yeah, it might look 
the most modern vehicles in three or four years time if, if models change but for a commercial vehicle you know it's there to do a job it's to, to do a job so you're, you're looking at warranty you're looking at five years um, and the biggest challenge or not the biggest challenge the biggest kind of spook for people to start by an electric vehicle is how much is the battery box mm. replacing battery and uh, to be honest it's relevant because if you take the vehicle's five year warranty after five year warranty um, <coughs> if a battery is, is weak or is down you've got a battery bank here Within the battery bank, you've got the seven cells, for instance, that makes a module, which is a bank of batteries, a bank of cells. Within the complete battery bank, then you've got <coughs> four of these. So we can go in and check the state of every single one of the cells. In this case, you've got a weak module, we can replace the module, and you're going to have a couple hundred quid to put a new module into your battery bank. So again, after five years' time, we can give you a health circuit vehicle, say, in your vehicle, X, Y, Z, it's got a battery, battery bank capacity of 85, 95% or whatever the case is. But the good news is we don't actually know what the battery life is for the vehicles that are on the, on the ground at the moment because m most of the vehicles that have been sold in the last 10 years are still out there and are still performing. So, you know, you could say to the, to the cynics, well, you were wrong. But you can't say to the optimist, you're right, because we haven't got that far yet. So we, we don't know what the answer is. But we do know that the batteries, the lithium-ion batteries, are holding up particularly well. We also know that the battery technology is improving dramatically every year. So, um, you know, if you buy a brand new EV today, it, it will have the vehicle will have a better range and it will be a more robust battery. Mm -hmm. So that that battery life should increase as things go on. You get the uh, feedback from the auction houses saying that an electric yeah. vehicle through the block it made two grand, the equivalent diesel bit four. Why would you go to electric again? In reality, it was yeah, it went through the block. There was no battery to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and that caused a lot of and again they say the, the second release. I think Nissan got badly burned for export vehicles as well, yeah. where someone took on the secretary and exported a complete vehicle. And um, but we looked at that at the very start, and was we were asked, would we do a different lease on the battery because it's a big battery? We said, no, it's a complete vehicle. Yeah. Uh, at least after the term, you're finished the vehicle, you can sell it on without having to get approval on who's going to take the battery. Yeah. If, they, if they stack up for financing the battery or, or, or not. So it's the complete asset stays with the, with, the, with the vehicle and again it's only helping recruit the residual values. The, the theory the theory with what Renault is had is was spot on mm -hmm. because people were worried about the life of the battery yeah. and, it, and, and yeah, Renault, Renault, Renault and this yeah. could say yeah. you don't have to worry about that that remains our problem but, but actually the LDB model it has been much more much more popular. Yeah. The life of an electric vehicle gets compared to a conventional diesel yeah. vehicle yeah. It, you know it's, it's longer um, if you talk to the big fleets in the UK, what they've noticed one thing straight away was that the drivers seem to mind the electrics a lot better than the diesel vehicles. And, that, um, and we've noticed that some of the diesel vehicles you know, had more hits than Elvis. You know, they're in bits. <laughs> we've got this good for DV beside it. They seem to mind them a bit better. Yeah. I don't know whether it's because they're just nicer to drive or they're <laughs> conscious that they're sitting within 400 volts and uh, <laughs> <laughs> they do seem to mind them a lot better but again the life of the vehicle seems to run it longer it's still going to clean this vehicle in 10 years time it's one of the things that you, that you look at and it's just frustrating in mind is, is the range that's quoted by manufacturers yeah you know and time free now manufacturers will have to quote wltp figures yeah so if you look at um, you know, 200 mile, they call it NEDC, which is basically tested in a nice environment with a half load. Mm. Um, no wing mirrors, that's something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all taped up, yeah. and that's the best it'll do. Yeah. Where WLTP will bring it from 200 realistically back to 160, you know, and it's more into real world uh, mm. use. One of the risks is people buying something thinking that, yeah, he said it'll do 140, or she said it'll do 140 or 150. In reality, it only does 100. And one of the key things, especially for the commercial side of things, is get a demonstration vehicle. Put it into your own application, mm -hmm. your own environment, work the vehicle and say, yeah, I'm happy that this ticks the box for me, or, or it doesn't. 
I mean, then there's other things where people say, well, you know, price of electric vehicles will come down. There's a strong possibility that they will. But on the other side, as like the flame departure warning, front and rear radar, as the more safety features are coming into legislation, they're bringing the pricing up. Yeah. On the other side, then you've got battery manufacturing. Now, <coughs> LDV, which is owned by SIAC, invested over a billion dollars into a company called CATL, who would be the third largest in the world of battery manufacturing, the biggest in China, who Tesla are now talking to in, in China about manufacturing ba batteries for Tesla. And that's to secure our future, not just for batteries, but for the battery management systems as well. And it's like your, your mobile phones. I mean, in, in, in a month's time, or two months' time, or a year's time, there may be an update to the software that's in your, in your vehicle to make your vehicle run a bit more efficient. And that. But if, if electric vehicle pricing does come down slightly, and over very slightly in that, the government subsidies that are there at the moment, let's say £8,000 for a van, they're never going to keep giving £8,000. So I mean, as vehicle prices come down, that's going to come down. And I think that's going to come down a lot quicker than the actual cost of the, of the, of the vehicle. And plus, in three years' time, residuals are going to be at, at, a, at a very decent um, point as well. So now is the mm. best time to make that transition. Mm -hmm.